So our, our organizers are, uh, one, by the way, I, we're recording the meeting. I hope that's okay with you. Uh, so it's organized by Helen Hasty, Peter McKenna, myself, Dave Robb, and Marta Romeo. Uh, and we are from the uh, UK RI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Node on Trust. And uh, so that's our uh, one of our major impetuses of getting involved. And we represented two universities, Hewitt University and Manchester University in the UK. And uh, the, the TAS, although it's a, a UK a initiative, the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems, we have today here, uh, our speakers are international. If we could have the next slide, please, Marta. I am seeing the next slide. Are you seeing it? Hey, I'm not seeing the next slide, no. Okay. Let's do this. I do Great. Now. So our, our, our agenda is, a, we've got four a, a great speakers with three presentations. So a, a two individual speakers and a joint presentation number two. So our, our keynote speaker, a, a Matthew Gomberley, he's a, from a Georgia Tech and he's, he's an assistant professor at Georgia Tech and head of the core robotics lab there. Uh, Jessica Barfield, Jess, is a doctoral student in information sciences at the University of Tennessee. And Yavor Dragostinov and uh, Danny uh, Hirtradush. I hope I pronounced that okay, Danny. I, they are, I, I, Yavor is a doctoral student in individual differences at Edinburgh University. And Danny is a research assistant at the Cecily Saunders Institute, King's College London. So that, that's our lineup of speakers for you. And our agenda is uh, we'll have the keynote uh, a presentation from Matthew. And uh, uh, following his presentation, uh, there'll be some time to ask you question, uh, to ask questions of him straight away if you like. Uh, then we'll move on to our, our two uh, uh, speakers, uh, two presentations. They are, a, for those ones, if you can save your questions until the moderated discussion uh, towards the end, and then Peter, Peter McKenna, will chair our moderated discussion where we'll, we'll uh, discuss the issues that have come up in our, our three presentations. And uh, during all that, uh, Marta will be keeping a track of things for us, Marta Romeo, and uh, uh, she'll put together a summary for us at the end and uh, hopefully we'll be able to pull out of that some common themes uh, that uh, apply to our, our aim of uh, doing, improving the way we present our questionnaires and use them in our HRI studies. So we'll, we'll kick off now with uh, our keynote sp speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Gombley from Georgia Tech. Matthew, if you'd like to go ahead and give your presentation, feel free to share your screen or your slides. And you're muted at the moment, Matthew. How about now? That's great. I can hear you fine, Matthew. Okay, fantastic. And do you see the correct version of the presentation? The correct view? Yes. All right, Perfect. fantastic. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. So um, thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, it was quite interesting to be asked to give a presentation on the sausage making, I think, of uh, human factors engineering, human robot interaction. It's the first time that I've really had an opportunity to, to address some of these issues um, in a purposeful way. So outside of, of maybe a classroom or, or a rant I give once in a while about the field messing up. Um, and we recently had a paper at the International Conference on Human Robot Interaction that was supposed to be in Cambridge in March of 2020. And I was a week away from getting on a plane when everything got shut down. Um, so that was a bummer. 
um, but I, I do hope to make it back uh, sometime. And feel free to interrupt me or, or ask questions. I'll, I'll try to save some time at the end. I know there's a lot to go through and want to keep us on time. Um, and, and I hope that you, my kind of objectives for today are to realize, um, to, to learn something, hopefully, uh, that you'll walk away with something that you've done in the past that wasn't so great, and maybe you'll do it better in the future. And I will tell that story through my own mistakes and, and what I've learned um, over the years and, and trying to improve and, and always having best practices. So I'm going to share a little bit about the research we're doing. It's definitely not from a point of, oh, look, we do great research. You know, you should cite our papers. That's not what this is about. This is telling a story of, of why we did certain things and um, maybe we could have done better and, and what we've learned for, for going forward. All right. So this is a picture, uh, hopefully you're seeing, of a labor and delivery floor at Beth Israel Deaconess, excuse me, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, um, Boston, Massachusetts. So the labor, uh, the labor floor um, here has one charge nurse. She's basically doing air traffic control, but it's way harder because you can't tell a woman, land your baby on runway 35 left. Like that doesn't really work. Um, you're not in control. And if you see to the far right, yes, at least in the United States, many of these hospitals still literally use whiteboards with rows and columns where you hand write information about each patient, a row for each patient, column for information about those patients. Um, it's uh, very difficult. That information is, uh, well, late. Uh, often it depends on residents to update it. The nurse has to decide what of 28 people are going to do what to which woman and uh, move these women through one of something like six different wards and coordinate with other resource uh, coordinators. Um, there's no decision support. And about half of them quit by the time I finished the two-year project I had when I was there as a PhD student. And my inspiration was what could robots do to help prevent operator burnout and, and also address uh, interoperator variability. So depending on which nurses running the floor, things may work well or not. So can we learn from the best nurses and try to standardize care? Um, and so kind of as a, a little primer on apprenticeship learning, if you wanna watch a nurse and learn from inferring, inferring through the actions she takes, a policy that represents her expert decision-making, the rules of thumbs that she used for deciding who does what, where, and when, um, you can kind of cast this problem as one of learning from demonstration in which you're given a Markov decision process without a reward function. So you don't know the objective and you don't know a policy to maximize this hidden objective. And one possible way to approach this is to find a policy pi that maps the state of the world to the action that you would take such that you minimize a measure of um, divergence between the expert's policy pi star and what the human, what the uh, robot would do in that same state. Okay, and so we have some cool work in my lab, for example, that we apply to ping pong, uh, where you can actually, we have methods uh, where we got a, we were a best paper finalist at the conference on robot learning last year, where we can actually figure out aut automatically what is better um, than the human demonstrator and try to do uh, learn uh, from human demonstration how to do better than actually the demonstrator. And so uh, we use some of these ideas in the uh, labor and delivery award. I'm going to play a video. Uh, forgive me if the volume is, is too loud, but the volume should come through. Hey, I would like to offer a recommendation. Please click on the waiting room tab. I recommend moving patient Kane to room R4 and for Nurse Misty to be her primary nurse. Would you like to accept or reject this recommendation? I will accept it. Okay. Um, and so what you should see here is uh, the virtual interface that we developed uh, to collect the data so the nurses would play a game of the world uh, that we developed with a student Nicole CO, and then you can see a decision tree version of, of part of the policy here to the right that the nurse would use for assigning patients in the waiting room uh, to an inpatient bed. Um, and we found that by then having the robot make decisions, nurses agreed with the advice about 90% of the time within about two hours of training, uh, which was 
pretty cool that we got to that point. Um, but is this going to actually help them? Uh, I think that's kind of an ethical thing that you need to address as a roboticist. Are we actually going to support the human uh, in this arrangement um, or are we going to harm them? So prior work, for example, with um, Paul Robinet and my former school chair, Ayanna Howard, they looked at uh, people in a simulated burning building and there was a rescue robot that would be set up to lead them to safety. And so I, you know, they had a fog machine or something to simulate the fire. Um, and the robot was equipped with like lights and um, different mechanisms of signaling to the person. And, and the robot would actually like pretend to malfunction and drive into a closet, like spin around emit lights to make it try to convince the person that the robot had failed. But often their subjects just kind of stayed there and watched the robot frolic around in a closet rather than deciding, oh, I should go rescue myself. Um, but those were with like college students. And you might ask, would a firefighter really just kind of sit there and watch a robot malfunction in a burning building? Like, I don't know. Um, and so we conducted one of the first ever human subject experiment, I think actually the second of its type, but the first with an actual physical robot, where we looked at with the, in the context of experts, does an anthropomorphic agent, so a physically embodied robot, in this case a now, help or hinder a nurse in deciding whether the advice quality coming from the agents is good and should be accepted or is bad and should be rejected. So we conducted a two by two experiment where the embodiment was either a computer-based decision support or a robot-based decision support. Um, and then we would manipulate using our machine learning algorithm. We could predict what good advice would be or bad advice. Um, and so we would control for that and see how what the rates of uh, type one and type two errors were in the nurse's decision making given robot or computer based decision support. So we hypothesized at least that we wanted robots not to make this worse. We didn't want the robot to fool the nurse. And so the nurse should have few misses, few false alarms, and like her trust in the robot should be roughly, really, roughly comparable to a computer based decision support system. Um, and then we did want nurses to like working with the robot. And one day, maybe the robot could do something more than just support with decision making, maybe it could do physical tasks. But for now, we just wanted to see would this be helpful from a decision making perspective. And so uh, some of the questionnaires that we used from, uh, for example, here from Gian uh, Bissans and Drury um, would look at um, a measure of trust in the robotic system. So the system is deceptive, the system behaves in an underhanded manner, you see here, and these would be given on um, kind of an ordinal scale, such as each of these being a Likert item that you strongly disagree or strongly agree with. And typically what we would do is replace the word system with robot or computer-based decision support system so subjects could differentiate that. Um, and then we would administer a, an anthropomorphization um, Likert scales. And then also uh, from this reference here, uh, measures of social attraction and tendency to form parasocial relationships with the decision support system. So what do we find? Uh, very importantly, that when you were showing a nurse um, bad advice, and then you switch to giving the nurse good advice, um, unfortunately, the false alarms um, were higher with the computer. So the nurses were continuing to reject good advice, thinking it was still bad. And then for the misses, that when you prime nurses with good advice and then you switch to bad advice, when they were working with the computer, they're more likely to miss the fact that you had switched to bad advice. So that's problematic. These um, uh, nurses are actually being more sensitive to the robot, which is good for us, bad for computer-based decision support. So there's something here about the physical embodiment or anthropomorphization of the robot that's causing nurses to detect, better detect a change in advice quality. And then also we found that their trust, their subjective trust in the system was much more sensitive to the advice quality when working with the robot. And, it, and it, anecdotally, what I found is that when the nurses worked with the robot, if it messed up or if it got it right, they were really angry or very happy. Whereas with the computer-based decision support system, they kind of just were like, yeah, okay, let's move on. They didn't really emote. Um, and then finally on an attitudinal scale, they, they did like working with the robot more. 
So it's subjective and objective evidence that they like working with our robot uh, and will benefit from it. So interesting, when I went to MIT Lincoln Laboratory, uh, so I got the, the job at uh, Georgia Tech. My wife um, is in healthcare, so she's a pediatric neuroimmunologist. She was finishing up a fellowship. And so I asked to, to defer my start date at Georgia Tech because uh, I didn't really want to leave Boston without her for a year. And so I went to MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And while I was there, I worked on transitioning my kind of understanding of human robot interaction to uh, the DOD space where they mostly work with radar um, and don't really understand humans. They just wanted a, an equation for humans. I wasn't quite able to give them that, but that's what they wanted. And so one of the things I did was work with uh, people in the Navy and said, hey, if we want to develop decision support tools, you, we can use this kind of give good advice or bad advice to, to regulate trust and reliance in these systems because we don't want people in the military just blindly following the advice of an automated system. Um, and so here they yelled at me. They yelled at me and said, you, thou shalt never give bad advice to my operators. And I was kind of dismayed because they have these real world problems. That's a lot like labor and delivery where you need to decide which decoy or countermeasure you're going to employ when, where, and how to protect a ship against uh, a rate of anti-ship missiles. It was like almost a one-for-one -one mathematical correspondence in the problem. And I thought like, I knew how to do this. Um, so I got yelled at. But when I spoke to the submarine, uh, people in the submarine uh, force, it was completely different. They actually said, we give bad advice to each other all of the time to see if some we can trick somebody into doing something stupid on a submarine because uh, it's very safety critical. Um, everyone in a submarine needs to know how to operate a nuclear reactor. They do not tolerate misses or false alarms. Um, and so I was like, why don't we take an idea from that culture and apply it in designing robot behaviors to design for accountability, hold like trying to trick each other on purpose and, and see what that might look like. Um, and so we design, designed one of the largest ex experiments uh, in terms of the number of factors, a four by four by two by two experiment. Uh, Manisha Nanarajan did this. It was very impressive, uh, varying the types of robots, the types of behaviors that were uh, shown to the users, either the robot would always be correct or it apologized if it gave you a wrong answer. Uh, it would just not care. It'd be indifferent if it gave you a wrong answer or it would tell you, hey, I tricked you. Don't take my bad advice is a way to modulate reliance. And we did physical robots versus a computer video of the robots. And then we also looked at a coalition building preface, which I'll mention in a minute. Here's a hint. 18 times 37 plus 781 ends in 27. Gotcha. You did not verify my hint. So that was the accountable behavior. It's kind of fun to see a robot like mocking a person for, for getting fooled by its advice. Um, so we found that trust was a function of anthropomorphism, but not virtual versus physical. And I think that has to do with the fact that our anthropomorphism scale really captured um, the physical versus virtual. So like somebody could see a physical robot and think it's not anthropomorphic um, or vice versa. And so I think trust here really has to do with the anthropomorphism and, and that if you, that's anthropomorphism, I think it's a mediating variable here for physical versus virtual embodiment. Um, and then we were able to lower inappropriate reliance and compliance in the robot through this kind of submarine like uh, behavior, but we didn't want to ruin trust. And so we thought about what if we told subjects, I want to help you succeed. I may sometimes give you bad advice just to make sure that you're paying attention. If you make a mistake, I will point it out to you. And so by doing that, we were able to increase trust while also mitigating type one and type two errors in operator decision making, which was pretty cool to get the best of both worlds. What are some of the lessons learned uh, through these experiments? All right, so I got two kids. My son is three. He loves Paw Patrol. And all I hear in my head is the different Paw Patrol things. I don't know if that's if you guys have that in the UK on Nickelodeon. Um, but uh, replicability. So I'm going to talk about that and using standardized questionnaires whenever possible. Second, you got to identify the right baseline metrics or else you're not going to find anything or it's going to be wrong. Um, and then finally, make a Likert scale. A single item doth not. All right. So let's start with rec replicability. So this is kind of coming from an Alt-HRI paper that we had um, last year. Um, 
And as a motivation, you may have heard that the field of psychology has really struggled with uh, replicability crisis. Um, different statistics you may have heard, you know, from 50 to 60 or even more percent of papers are failing to be replicated in that field. I think part of it has to do with um, uh, the heterogeneity in the sample population, humans are just messy. I think some of it has to do with poor experiment design and part of it has to do with lack of uh, statistical rigor. And some of the issues are, you know, for example, p-hacking. We often love to change our models just to eke out the statistical significance. I'm guilty of it too. I'm not going to say that, you know, I'm holier than thou, I do it too. And we have to try not to. And I think that's why hypothesis-driven research is important and that you actually should establish your hypotheses beforehand uh, to hold yourself accountable. Um, the problem is manipulating your hypotheses after the fact, which is extremely tempting to do. And, and I've certainly done it before. Um, and, and lack of cystic rigor. I remember I'll, I'll, this person will remain anonymous. I remember talking about this issue at a AAAI fall symposium series and saying like, we have to do better in statistics because like we're doing really bad stuff and a review of, of the field that I did back then, um, looking at, at whether people are appropriately using non-parametric versus parametric tests um, and, and checking assumptions for normality and homoscedasticity. And a student or a researcher at the time said, well, like, how can you possibly be good at everything? How can you be good at robots, at human factors, at psychology research and statistics? And I said, either you be good at everything or you find somebody who's good at the thing you're not at and you work with them. Like we can't just put out bad stuff simply because we don't think we can be a master of everything. Um, I know that's kind of harsh, but like we have a higher calling that we have to live up to. Um, and so part of, part of these issues, I think, is that people will use ad hoc questionnaires that they come up with and do not validate, that don't have any kind of provenance that, that need to come with. There's a reason why we have validated questionnaires. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So if you must create a questionnaire, don't just make it up. I've done this before. We shouldn't be doing it. There's actually established procedures for designing questionnaires where you enumerate scales and subscales, you pilot those questionnaires, get data, you do a factor analysis and determine loading factors, then you revise and add items to isolate loading factors and ensure enough items per factor, you rinse and repeat. And this can take a lot of time. Um, and so here's an example of, for like a big five personality type survey where they enumerated all of these questions you'll see to the right, uh, measuring like, do you tend to be quiet? Are you talkative? Are you outgoing sociable? Is it sometimes, are you sometimes shy, introverted? You ask the same thing a million times to try to look at your, your replicates. Like, are you able to uh, get people to be consistent? And then you see across these columns, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, negative emotionality or neuroticism and then open-mindedness, uh, openness. You see that, for example, extroversion in this loading analysis that the vast majority of these terms in the first column for extroversion are bolded here, meaning that they're primarily loading on an extroversion category and not on the other categories. And so what that means here is that you have a set of something like 12 questions or prompts that are all giving you a sense about one dimension of personality. And that's really what you want in your questionnaires is to do this principal component analysis and make sure things are are really nicely independent and, and grouped and that you have uh, multiple uh, questions per answer and so or per category. And so for more, I'd in turn you to Costello and Osborne from 2005. Next, identify the right baseline metrics. So in some of our work, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. We wanna see if learning from demonstration can work in the real world and robots are gonna fail in the real world, fail to learn what you tried to teach them. So what happens? Um, so we did an experiment where humans would teach robots through various methods, kinesthetic teaching, teleoperation, or motion capture. Um, and we pose certain key research questions, such as how does the mode of teaching impact a teacher's confidence in their own ability to teach? How does uh, failure affect your own confidence in your ability to teach? And workload um, and other measures, and then what are predictors, demographic and personality predictors of, of teacher resiliency to failure? Um, and so we were through statistical analysis and mediation analysis, we were able to determine, for example, that actually 91% of whether you think you're a good teacher comes from what you think the robot thinks of you, which is crazy. It's not actually did you succeed or fail. It's what you think the robot thinks of your success or failure. 
Um, and so by doing mediation analysis and collecting the baseline metrics, um, for example, here, gender anthropomorphization of Sawyer, agreeable, so a big five, agreeableness and conscientiousness, you're actually better able to tease out the variance, account for the variance in your model. Um, age here was important, trust and automation. And I think you might have decision errors if you aren't collecting these metrics. It's not a phishing exercise, although it could turn into that. Um, but for example, here, we found that a personality traits, agreeableness, and conscientiousness were very important. Agreeableness could potentially help account for the screw you effect. If somebody's highly disagreeable, they probably aren't going to be very cooperative in your experiment, and that might matter. Conscientiousness deals with how well are you going to do the job of the experiment itself. And so if you aren't measuring things like the screw you effect in your experiments, you're probably going to get a bad answer. I'm not saying the wrong answer, but you're going to have some unexplained variants that could lead you to make a mistake. And then finally, making, uh, oh, and last one, definitely ask people how much they work with robots. Gauge video game experience and how much they work with robots, because those two things are very, very important. Video game experience is incredibly important. Um, and then finally, uh, for Likert scales, um, I know we're running short on time. So um, for measuring a Likert scale, so if you haven't seen one, this is a Likert scale. You're going to have a set of Likert items um, that go here uh, vertically in the first column. And then you're going to measure on an ordinal scale from strongly disagree to strongly disagree whether you uh, feel and, and support of the Likert item. And then what you do is you assess uh, the numbers here. So disagree being a negative two, so you come up with some kind of mapping and then you sum across the Likert items. What most people do is test the individual Likert items. They will run a t-test on just most robots make poor teammates. I've done this before, but that's not what Likert wanted from his scales. He wants you to sum across them, but tons of papers being published in HRI and the Journal of HRI and Roman test individual Likert items still. I've done it in my past publications and I'm never doing it again once I learned that this is actually really bad statistically and was never how these things were supposed to be used. Um, and so here's some uh, data, basically 97% of people are getting stuff like this wrong. And so that makes you wonder how many of those results are problematic. That's tough. So uh, I have uh, some recommendations that you want to avoid your misnomers for the help of, of replicability. Don't use single liquid items. Make sure you have enough numbers of items and you uh, are addressing the proper statistical test because you don't get to use a t-test unless your assumptions are validated and you're summing across a full Likert scale. And so I just wanna acknowledge the sponsors that have gone into the research that I've shared with you and uh, happy to, to take any questions if there's time. Otherwise, uh, I'll be happy to connect with you. You feel free to email me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. That's that's great. I tell you what, folks, I know I did say you could give your questions to Matthew immediately after his talk, but uh, due to the, the time, we, we, we were five minutes late starting Matthew on his, on his talk. So, uh, Matthew, you've kept fairly well to time, uh, except you, you, you've talked a wee bit into your question, uh, 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 five minutes, but not to worry. Uh, people, if you save your questions for Matthew and we'll, we'll field all the questions together for the talks during the moderation discussion uh, uh, towards the end, if that's okay. Yep. And Sounds great. So, Thank yep. you. So that's a really interesting talk, Matthew, and we'll come back to the to the points in your talk in our moderated discussion. Uh, so it, it's time now for us to uh, invite uh, uh, Jessica Barfield to give her talk about her experience with a, a subjected questionnaires in her work in, in HRI. Uh, uh, on you go, uh, Jessica, if you'd like to feel free to share your screen if you'd like to do that. All right, thank you. Let's see here. Oops. Well, Paul Jessica's setting up her screen, I just say thank, thank you very much. A really interesting talk, by the way, Matthew. Okay, so on you go, Jessica. All right. Um... All right, so um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jess, Jessica. Um, I'm a PhD student um, in information sciences at the University of Tennessee. Um, this little picture is from game day. So I'm 
um, surrounded by a sea of orange here. Um, but I'm delighted to be here to talk about my experiences in designing and administering surveys for HRI research. And um, I'm going to plan to talk about um, kind of these basic issues in questionnaire design that relate to HRI. And in some cases, I'll definitely talk about um, my own specific issues that I've learned doing my own research here at UT. Um, so there are a lot of reasons to use questionnaires in HRI research. Um, of course, and um, over the past year, um, due to COVID, um, the use of a questionnaire um, allowed me to reach out to subjects off campus. Um, since you know we're not really since last year, especially and in moving into this year, um, we haven't been on campus as much. All of last year was online, actually, um, so I didn't have access to these introductory um, courses that. Um, you know, subject pools of students on campus. Um, and obviously we didn't bring them into a lab. So instead using questionnaires allowed me to use, to distribute surveys um, using social media platform as well as survey distribution sites. So for my research, primarily on self-disclosure to robots and discrimination against robots, um, questionnaires have been, specific, have, have been especially helpful. Um, and so something about that I'd like to say about quantitative research methods that I think is really important is that not only can Likert scale questions be used, but several experiments can also be run in one questionnaire, um, which I was actually able to do recently. I was able to run six different studies um, in one questionnaire, which was very, very, which is a very cool research method. Um, so it's all about the, ro the robot stimuli that the subjects are exposed to and how the robots that the participants experience are designed. So on this slide, um, this is just a, a simple example. You know, here, let's say we're interested in robot appearance um, with uh, and voice enablement for an HRI study. So with two levels of each independent variable, um, we can run a two by two factorial study, right? A very simple um, design here. So the dependent variable, of course, is the answers to the Likert scale questions. Um, and by the way, I would like to mention too, that based on my experience, I would only recommend about 10 questions per experiment, um, especially if something, um, if a tool such as MTurk, um, Amazon Mechan Mechanical Turk is being used so that participants really do stay focused. Um, and so again, like I said, um, because it wouldn't take much time to complete a, a simple two by two, um, I was able to actually run six different um, studies in one, um, in one go with the same pool of participants, which again was a really cool experience. Um, on here. So running a questionnaire experiment here. So in this slide, I'd like to point out that how subjects are really run through the experiment is an extremely important factor, right? So for example, we can have within as well as between subject factors, which of course means that there is, um, is extremely careful attention to how participants are run through the treatment conditions. So if they're shown all conditions, if they're shown just one condition, um, it's extremely important to report this. And the main point I want, I'd like to make for this slide is that not only can we use questionnaires to run these experiments um, outside of robotics labs, um, but we can run different things, types of experiments just depending on the purpose of that study as well. Um, so here I'd like to emphasize a few points, um, all based on my personal experiments, experience designing questionnaires. Um, the main point is that not only can um, quantitative data be collected, but also qualitative data. And here, this really allows the participants to express their feelings, their thoughts, and really their in-depth experiences as well. Um, and I think the issue here is that you need to think ahead about how you're going to analyze your, these responses if qualitative data is collected. So um, with different methods, you, know, you may want to produce a code, so a code sheet or code book for scoring these responses before the study is run. Or, um, or you determine a way to code the responses after if you're seeing patterns. Um, but my personal experience that um, here as well with these open-ended questions is that unless you have very motivated subjects, it may be difficult to keep your participants, uh, you know, motivated to answer these in detail. So you may want to ask subjects if they want to, if they will agree to be interviewed a few days after the study. Um, and I found um, success using this method. Um, that way you can do a semi-structured interview and collect more of those in-depth responses. 
Um, a little personal anecdote here. In my studies on the disclosure of personal information to robots, um, and um, in, in, in that study, it required quite sensitive um, information, potentially embarrassing questions as well. I found that the nature um, that making sure that these um, answers and responses are all anonymous. Um, and that really gave the participants reassurance that they um, could answer these questions honestly without any answers being traced back to them. So when it comes to writing these questions, um, again, like I said, you know, you need to think about how these questions will be analyzed. Uh, but not only that, but how it helps answer the research questions. As mentioned in the keynote, thinking about those research questions um, and using scales, um, established scales that exist and not simply just writing new questions that may be interesting to answer, although that is that sometimes can be very tempting. Um, but keeping in mind how each question um, or each scale item does help to answer your research questions questions. Um, something um, my experience as well is that it's essential to pilot these questions. Again, this was mentioned earlier in the keynote, but using peers or even a pilot group um, just to make sure that each question really does get at the core of what your research is about here and what you're trying to understand. Um, another note that I found um, that, that I found to be quite interesting is the way that people would answer questions. So piloting helps make sure that each question truly is understandable and that every participant will ask it, will answer it in the same way. So even simple questions such as asking participants their, their age um, and saying nothing else. So for example, some participants may say they're 25, other participants will say they're 25 and a half or, 20, or 25 years and six months. Um, so making sure that you fully explain even those simplest questions. Um, and this can be done by expl further explaining, giving more instructions, as well as limiting subjects to a specific answer type, which I found um, easy to do with using Qualtrics. So when it comes to administering the questionnaire, um, I try to limit my online surveys to under 15 minutes and preferably um, even, even less time uh, perhaps 10 minutes or so. But, you know, no matter the length of the survey, I found it too is essential to include various attention checks and even te technical checks, you know, maybe limiting these to two or three um, as to not, you know, act as if you're testing your subjects. Um, but I always add these in just to make sure that participants are paying attention. I normally try to get these large, large sample sizes, um, upwards of 300, 400 sometimes. So disregarding some data is generally not a problem as long as these exclusion criteria are established before the experiment is run. And obviously not after you look at the data. And that of course gets into some of that um, p-hacking and everything talked about earlier. Um, also, when you use these large survey distribution sites such as Amazon MTurk, um, you know, you do have to um, make sure that you have some sort of quality filter. Um, so, for example, using MTurk, I recommend using a 95% approval rating based on, you know, their previous surveys and tasks that they completed. Um, and then the last question here, or the last um, bit here is the, the repetition of the stimuli. Um, I, again, based on my experience, I recommend showing the stimuli for each question rather than just once and then asking a series of questions. That repetition then captures, you know, keeps um, and maintains the uh, participants um, attention throughout the survey. Um, here, I'm going to show you a couple of different um, checks that I use that I thought would be kind of fun to, to look at. So this is one that I um, that I typically include different versions of it, and this is an example. So it's a short, def it's a, um, a little bit of a paragraph to read, but this way, you know, you can make sure that your participant runs through or reads through the entire um, paragraph, a little bit about what attention checks are, and then if they just read the question, what color is the sky, they'll automatically say blue. But as you can see in the last sentence, it says, if you don't select orange, um, you know, I had to choose orange because of UT, um, then they're automatically, um, filtered out to the end of the survey. And of course, this bit up here is not shown to the participant. Um, this was just the view in Qualtrics. Um, another thing that may be necessary is a technical check. Um, a lot of times I use um, 
videos or sound in my surveys. So, um, and I'll play this video in a, in a moment, but this is a common one that I use. And again, there are many, uh, many versions of this, but here the question um, would be, what animal do you hear in the video? So this ensures that um, the video playback is running as well as sound um, because you may be tempted to choose elephant. However, you play it. <laughs> So when you so when you when they play it, um, then you know you can hear a dog barking. So again, that that filter criteria is um, enabled such that if they don't pick dog, then they're automatically um, filtered to the end of the survey. Oops, going again. <laughs> Um, so a question that I'm sometimes asked is how do I design the questionnaire given there may be, there may not be established, an established questionnaire, um, in my, on my topic of research. And in my case, I get inspiration as well as existing scales, um, on pa from papers that aren't necessarily in HRI or even robotics. Um, in these papers, I normally find ar areas um, of interest and um, just look at looking at previous literature. So, for example, um, faculty at the University of Michigan um, did interesting research on self-disclosure of personal information regarding social media sites. Um, again, not an HRI study, but um, in my study, which also involved self-disclosure, um, I was able to um, use similar quest questions um, that were already established and tested. Um, and obviously citing those papers as well. Um, and this kind of allowed me to discuss how my result fit into the broad literature on self-disclosure and hopefully make a specific con contribution to HRI in general. Yes, can, can you make it one more minute, please? Yes. Okay. Um, so given the limit, given the time limits, um, my last one main point here is that the questionnaire is not a static instrument. So surveys can include audio as well as video um, so that participants can really interact with the stimuli. Um, you know, and this actually allows people to or allows a researcher to give the image attributes such as a personality. So a common um, one thing that I do here um, is add voice, um, which can and you, here you can manipulate the gender and personality. Um, so I'll have a stimuli such as this robot and then Yeah, so then it'll have um, some sort of voice um, to again give it some physical um, or personality attributes. All right, so that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate um, being uh, being here and being able to kind of share my experiences and lessons learned. Um, my contact information is here as well um, if you have any questions after our moderated discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. That's a, a, that's a really interesting talk. A, and a, folks, if you have any questions for Jessica, you can save them up or feel free to type them into the Zoom chat if you want. And uh, Peter will collate and uh, uh, we'll have a record of them there for us to talk about in our moderated discussion. Uh, now, uh, so the next next item on our agenda is our, uh, our uh, final talk which is a joint talk uh, given by uh, uh, Danny and Yavor. So Yavor, are, are you ready to go ahead, share your screen if you want? Yeah. Uh, uh, is uh, Danny online with you, yeah? Yeah. Cool, go ahead. Thanks for being ready. Um, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Uh, okay. Maybe if you, uh, maybe if you, uh, but you should be in as a speaker, so you should be able to try try sharing your your screen. I, I, I did, and it just. Okay. Oh, oh no, there you go, there you go. Yeah. I've You're just it. made your co-host Yavor. I should help. Well done, Peter. Um, okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, just before we start, full disclosure, I'm in the process of moving flats and I'm constantly anxious about the internet situation because a bit of a mess. So Dave, please interrupt me if something isn't great with the connection. Go ahead, everything's looking looking great at the moment. Awesome, okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Yavor and I'm a second year PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh, specializing in personality psychology. Uh, both myself and Danny are very thrilled to be here, uh, and special thanks to Peter and Dave for inviting us. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, 
kind of the background of personality science as personality has a particular ongoing marriage with quantitative statistical methods, which is kind of what we're talking about. Uh, we will be also talking about uh, the work we've done with the trust node, as well as some of the uh, future work we aim to do and the importance of working across multiple fields. Um, so let's start off with what personality psychology is. Obviously, we've mentioned it uh, in, in the two talks prior to this. Um, personality looks, uh, personality science looks for ways in which people psychologically differ from one another in their everyday lives. And this could be within or between any group they belong to. Um, what trait scientists tend to investigate is uh, whether the changes are consistent over time in situations, whether they form broader patterns, what may have caused them, and what consequences they might have. Now, something that is quite common for trait scientists is to look at patterns of behavior that tend to go along happy and healthy uh, pattern uh, lives so that um, such patterns can be promoted. Um, they first have to carefully map out those patterns, but essentially uh, emphasizing the, the fact that people are different and that is completely normal is crucial because it fosters tolerance and it invites us to use the variations wisely. So in other, in other words, um, the more we know about our differences, uh, their causes and uses, the less likely we are to use them for hopefully malicious intent and uh, more, the more able we are to capitalize on them for everyone's benefit. Now, um, how did we, me and Danny, uh, get here? Um, so let's talk about uh, propensity to trust. Um, essentially, what the trust node focuses, as I'm sure most of you know, is how to build, maintain, and manage trust in robotic and autonomous systems. And uh, we thought that, um, in order for us to even begin to try to answer such a complicated question, we must be able to measure propensity to trust. Otherwise, even if there is progress made in building, maintaining, and managing trust, um, it would be particularly difficult for us to realize it and to utilize it. And for example, um, if we can compare uh, the progress prior to um, changes being made and after, um, et cetera. Um, so in order for us to measure propensity to trust, we need a reliable measure, a measure that has gone through rigorous psychometric validity stages. And Danny will be talking about that in a minute, uh, about the specific uh, stages that we are working on. Um, but essentially, I'm going to walk you through what led us to make the decision of developing such a trust um, scale ourselves. Um, as Matthew mentioned, um, sorry, one, one second. Um, so propensity to trust, uh, this is one of the definitions is the extent to which uh, one displays a consistent tendency uh, to be willing to depend on others in general across a broad spectrum of situation in the person. So this is just uh, another indication that uh, propensity to trust is in fact a personality trait and looking at the personality literature is a good way to start. So we essentially went through the big five model, um, like uh, Matthew mentioned it before. It's a very established uh, personality theory uh, used by psychologists that um, basically looks at five core aspects of personality, openness to experience is one of them, uh, followed by conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And you should kind of look at the big five is more of a scale rather than a binary yes or no, whether people have it or not. Uh, people usually have average levels of a trait. Sometimes they have low and sometimes they have high. And essentially uh, the big five uh, motto is a bit more complicated than it looks. It also uh, contains facets and um, nuances. These are some of the facets of it. And as you can see, uh, the agreeableness factor, uh, the first facet that comes is trust. So essentially we looked at um, the questionnaire for the trust facet, but we weren't really satisfied with some of the reliability, um, the way it was uh, basically uh, run as a um, reliability uh, measurement. So we then decided to look at the more specific uh, personality, uh, the more specific propensity to trust literature instead of the broad general personality literature. 
And we were fortunate to find a very useful qualitative meta-analysis that uh, looked at some of the existing measures of propensity to trust between 1966 and 2018. Uh, 26 measures were identified in 179 studies, um, which were, we were particularly surprised as propensity to trust isn't a very common um, thing that happens in personality psychology. Um, overall, the conclusions were that there's some significant methodological concerns regarding several of the scales and a case was made for a more considered selection of scales for uh, future research. So that uh, essentially inspired us to um, develop such a scale of our own. And I'm going to hand it over to Danny, who will talk about more of the specific ways to do that. Yeah, uh, could you move on to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. So just to um, reiterate the few points that Yavor just brought up, um, as you said, we are working on this project that aims to develop a measurement tool to measure propensity to trust in human, in HRI and uh, hopefully beyond. And um, as he also explained, pro propensity to trust is a stable and dispositional factor affecting individual differences in the likelihood to trust others. And here it is defined as a general willingness to trust others regardless of social and relationship specific information. Um, and um, we want, to, and yeah, so because it's a stable, sorry. <laughs> so it fits the criteria of a personality trait, like he also said, and because it's a stable and um, trait that is variable between individuals, it can be meaningfully measured and used as a predictor for outcomes for groups and individuals. And here, what we're trying to do here within the trust node is um, use it as a potential predictor of trust in HRI or as like a part of a model of trust in HRI. Uh, but like Yavor also said, we currently do not have a valid measure um, of propensity to trust. So, which is why we're developing one. And much like uh, Matthew talked about without a validated measure, the results themselves will also not be valid. So we need to have a rigorously validated measure. Um, so just to take you through the steps of the project, the first step is item selection. So we went through the literature, identified existing measures and items, and then the immediate research team refined this list, mostly focusing on excluding really bad items. Um, and these were items that were either like, had weird historic references or had religious references or were too context dependent or only um, relevant to specific groups and also items that um, didn't fit with our definition of others, because we want to use this in human robot interaction, the other's identity, the, the entity that you're trusting needed to be a little bit more awake than just humans. Um, and then the third step in item selection was, could you go back, sorry. sorry. The third step and final step in item selection is a Delphi survey that we're currently in the middle of. And this is a way to get expert consensus in a more structured way than is usually done um, to then decide to uh, retain or uh, remove items based on a big pool of experts or you know, relatively big pool of experts. Um, and this helps us establish some initial content and face validity of the measure. And then if we move on, we move into the sort of initial validity testing, which will be what we do next. And that is when we have a, uh, a set, uh, so we have, we'll have a usable measure at this point, a usable list of items. We will uh, collect responses to it uh, online and conduct an exploratory factor analysis to explore the structure of the measure. And this uses the covariance between individual items to identify the most suitable number of di di dimensions that underlie the psychological construct of propensity to trust. And as well, we'll identify the contents of each dimension and how they relate with one another. Again, this is an exploratory process. So at this point, we make no assumptions about the factor structure of the measure. However, these results alongside existing theoretical frameworks uh, will establish a hypothesis about the tool's internal structure that, that can then be tested. And at this point, like Matthew mentioned before as well, we might still need to drop items because they're performing poorly or refine them or even add items if the tool proves to be incomplete. 
Uh, and then we move on to the confirmatory testing, which is following the exploratory testing. So at the end of the EFA pro process, we will have a proposed factor structure that can then be tested using a confirmatory factor analysis. Um, and that essentially tests if the identified structure holds up in a separate sample that we will collect. Um, and this will establish some structural or construct validity. And we will also look into the reliability of the measure, of course, including internal reliability, which is its uh, consistent consistency within itself. And importantly, test for test reliability, which is often neglected. But uh, basically, it tests if uh, the results of the measure replicate in a second assessment. And this is very important when we're measuring personality traits as one of their defining um, traits is that they're stable, right? Um, and so following this rigor, uh, rigorous psychometric process, we will have a tool that can hopefully be implemented within HRI to measure uh, propensity to trust. And just a few concluding remarks. Uh, we just wanted to highlight how uh, nicely this project uh, sort of exemplifies the importance and usefulness of interdisciplinary work. Uh, and again, this goes in line with the keynote of Matthew's point of like, if you don't know how to do something, get someone who knows it, right? Um, but here we're using methods uh, that are traditionally more sort of pronounced within psychology, education and applied health sciences uh, within HRI to sort of measure the sort of more often considered sort of soft personality traits uh, that in a valid way. And without a valid measure, uh, a, tr a model of trust in HRI could be incomplete because either we'd not be measuring propensity to trust or we'd be measuring it um, in an invalid way, resulting in invalid results. And just additionally, um, a, the, to touch on the usefulness of interdisciplinary work once more, um, the outcome that we'll produce from this work will ultimately benefit all the sort of fields involved and hopefully be useful beyond and we'll hopefully be, hopefully be able to promote it more because we come from different backgrounds as well. So that's also very useful. Um, so that's us. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, Thank you, Danny and, and Yavor for, for, for that. Oh, sorry, uh, Yavor, go ahead and say. No, no, just a list of uh, the people we're uh, working with on this project. Great, thanks.